Take your Bibles this morning and turn to John's Gospel. John's Gospel, chapter 2 today. We are taking a break from our study of the Pentateuch for a few weeks. Today we're here in John chapter 2. Next week we're jumping to John chapter 6. And then uh, we have several guest speakers who will be filling the pulpit through the month of July. And then after that, Lord willing, we'll get back into the Pentateuch with the book of Deuteronomy. But today we're here in John chapter 2. We're going to put the words here on the screen. Follow along with me as I read John 2, 1 through 11. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water now become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first. And when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory. And his disciples believed in him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You pray with me again. Thank you, God, for your word. I pray that you would now, by your spirit, open our hearts, illuminate our hearts so that we understand what you're saying to us. And as we've been saying over and over this morning, that you would, through this, give us a sense, a vision, a picture of your glory so that we can rejoice. That's what we want. That's what we need. We pray that you would do it. In Jesus' name, amen. Derek Webb was a Christian songwriter. Uh, and singer. Uh, he was with a group called Cademan's Call for a long time, and, and then he, he, he became a solo artist in 2003 or so. And, and the reason I say he was a Christian songwriter and singer is because in more recent years, he's kind of walked away from the faith and gone in some very disturbing directions and said some dangerous things, and, and uh, it's very disappointing. But, but during his earlier days, he wrote some amazing Songs, some theologically powerful songs. And we know that God sometimes uses crooked sticks to draw straight lines, as the old cliche goes. And, and so I was thinking about one of his songs this week. It's a song from his first solo album, which was entitled, She Must and Shall Go Free. And one of the songs on that album called Lover is a song written from the perspective of Jesus and his experience in the world. And I was thinking this week about the last stanza of that song. It goes like this. Again, this is from the perspective of Jesus. I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. So you bring all your history and I'll bring the bread and wine. And we'll have us a party where all the drinks are on me. And as surely as the rising sun, you will be set free. I was thinking about, thinking about that line. Well, you bring all your history. I'll bring the bread and wine. We'll have a party where all the drinks are on me. That's really what we're talking about this morning. I'm sure that Derek Webb, as he wrote that, was thinking about this story in John's Gospel, where Jesus is the one who provides for the wedding feast. But not only does he provide for the wedding feast uh, that happened there in Cana 2,000 years ago, but that, as a symbol, becomes how the, Jesus provides for the ultimate wedding feast. Jesus is the one who makes all of the provision. We bring nothing except, as that song says, our history. We bring our history. We bring our submission. That's it. Jesus does all the rest. The greatest relationship of all is offered to us by Jesus Christ, but only once we accept that we have nothing to offer but ourselves. I'm inviting you to reflect on that this morning as we continue to study this passage. And, and uh, what I want you to do this morning as we look at this story in John's Gospel is to think about it with a particular bent in mind. I want you to read this through a particular lens. In order to understand what's really happening in the story, I think you have to first understand the motif of marriage 
in Scripture. Marriage is a hugely important idea in Scripture. Uh, So it's been pointed out many times by many different theologians and Bible scholars that the Bible story starts with marriage and it ends with marriage. We see Adam and Eve married in the Garden of Eden. God created that relationship, that marriage. And we see marriage as the culminating relationship in Revelation 2. There it's the relationship between God and his people, between Christ and his church. And then that forms the paradigm for the rest of Scripture. Throughout the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, we see marriage as the picture of the ultimate relationship that we're supposed to have with God. So in the Old Testament, God calls himself, and we've seen this, haven't we, in the Pentateuch already many times, God calls himself the husband, and Israel, his people, are his wife, his bride. And that imagery is picked up in the New Covenant, in the New Testament. And you know, by the way, that those words testament, those are synonyms for covenant, right? The Old Testament is the record of the Old Covenant. The New Testament is the record Uh, the the, the standards for the new covenant. In the new covenant, in the New Testament, we see that Old Testament picture of God as the husband and his people as his wife picked up by Jesus, who audaciously calls himself the bridegroom, leaving no doubt about how he understands himself to be the incarnation of God. He is the bridegroom and his people are his bride. Only now his bride, his people, is understood to be not just the nation state of Israel, but people from every tribe and tongue and people and nation, the new Israel. It's the wedding, it's the marriage. That's such an important theme, an important motif throughout Scripture. And so what I want you to do this morning, as we look at this story of this particular wedding ceremony in Cana, I want you to read it through that lens. I want you to keep in mind the fact that the ultimate relationship between God and his people is the true marriage, and that every earthly marriage, every individual earthly marriage is meant to be a symbol and a pointer to that ultimate relationship. And so we have this idea, our greatest relationship of all, the greatest possible relationship of all is offered to us in that ultimate relationship, and it's offered to us by Jesus Christ, but only once we accept that we have nothing to offer but ourselves. I want to say another word, too, here. Whether or not you have been a participant in an earthly marriage, this is what is held out to you. So whether you are somebody who, by the grace of God, has been allowed to participate in that earthly symbol, or whether you are somebody who, by the same grace of God, has been called to abstain from that earthly symbol, you are offered this perfect relationship with God. And it's offered in Jesus Christ. So we see this in John 2, and a little bit of context in John 2, of course, as well. We know that John's gospel begins with those famous words where John talks about the beginning of the world, and the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made, which is poetic language, but it simply goes to describe the fact that Jesus, whom John characterizes as the Word, is God. And he is the creator. He made everything. Nothing was made except by him. Everything that has been made was made by Jesus. That becomes important throughout the gospel. That's an important foundation for everything else that John tells us. Throughout John chapter 1, we see the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry. He's baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan River. He calls his first disciples. If you were to go back into John chapter 1, you would see that. And, And that's the beginning of his earthly ministry. So that by the time we get into John 2... And we find out that now Jesus, along with some of those disciples, is going to this wedding in Cana. We're not surprised anymore. And that's how John 2 opens, as we just read. On the third day, there was a wedding. uh, The mother of Jesus, Mary, was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. This morning, what we're going to do is we're going to have three main ideas that will be kind of the tent pegs for our message. We'll talk about the marriage itself, the miracle, and the meaning of it. The marriage, the miracle, the meaning. The greatest relationship of all is offered to us by Jesus Christ, but only once we accept that we have nothing to offer but ourselves. So consider the marriage. Consider the wedding ceremony as it's described to us here in John 2. The first thing we see after the the fact is given to us that Jesus' mother Mary and Jesus and his disciples are there at the wedding, the first thing we see is that there's a problem. Verse 3, it says, When the wine ran out... Which, by the way, is a striking way to start a story, I think. If I were writing the story, I would say, you know, a sad thing happened at the wedding. They didn't plan well enough, and the wine ran out. But that's not how John starts it. He just kind of assumes the fact, like, we all know the wine's going to run out. So when it ran out, here's what happened. 
to me as I read that, it's almost as though John right from the get-go is saying, from a human perspective, anything that can go wrong will go wrong. Or even better, theologically, from a human perspective, it's a foregone conclusion that we're never going to be able to do it well enough. It's always going to fail if we're left to ourselves. Okay? So John says, when the wine ran out, Mary, although he doesn't name her, the mother of Jesus, comes to him and says, they have no wine. Mary is concerned about this situation. And you have to understand this uh, through the perspective of the first century a little bit to get what's going on here. Some uh, Bible students have, have suggested, and it's a reasonable suggestion, that given the proximity of Cana to Nazareth, where Mary and Jesus uh, spent most of their, uh, their, their family time growing up, um, that there's a possibility that there's a family relationship between Mary and the person who's getting married here. And, and this is furthered by the fact that Mary seems to be intimately connected with the events of the wedding. Maybe she's part of the planning group here. She knows that the wine has run out. Presumably not many other people know that the wine has run out and she's trying to get ahead of it, trying to solve the problem, you know. Whatever the reason, though, she's concerned about the situation. They have no wine, she says. This was a shameful thing for something to happen in the first century. Again, something else you have to understand in, in, in that culture, in, in Middle Eastern cultures in general, even today, but especially back in the first century, the, the planning for a wedding celebration was the responsibility of the groom, the groom and the groom's family through the wedding feast. And it was a feast that would sometimes last for four or five days or one or two weeks, right? This was a big deal. And for the food to run out or for the wine to run out was a symbol of the fact that the bridegroom had not prepared adequately. He made a mistake and, and it would have brought shame upon him and upon his family. And Mary obviously is very concerned about that. We do things differently in our culture today, don't we? And so we have to understand the differences. In our, in our culture, the tradition is that it's the, uh, the bride's family that pays for a wedding. And can I, can I just suggest that as the father of three daughters, I think we should get back to the biblical model. <laughs> I'm going to start a petition after the service. Jesus' mother is concerned about the shame that will accrue to this this bridegroom into his family, and so she comes to Jesus. And it's not terribly surprising that she just automatically comes to Jesus with this concern. We don't know what happened to Joseph, Mary's husband, who we, you know, we, we think of rightly, I think, as the adoptive father, so to speak, of Jesus. We don't know where he is, but he seems to be out of the picture by this point. The last time we saw him was uh, during that trip to Jerusalem, remember, when Jesus was 12 years old. Um, we don't see him after that. Certainly we know by the time Jesus ends his earthly ministry, is crucified, uh, he gives charge of his mother to John, the disciple, which seems to tell us that Joseph is completely out of the picture. Maybe he's died early in Jesus' life. And if that's the case, then... It also seems likely that Mary has learned by this time to rely on her oldest son, to trust him, to help take care of things in the family. And so it's natural that she now comes to him with this problem. They have no wine. The implicit suggestion from the mother is, I need you to do something about this. Okay. Which makes Jesus' response all the more surprising, yeah? Look at verse 4. Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. First, consider his address to his mother. He calls her woman. A lot of translations will try to soften that. The NIV says, dear woman, dear woman. And, and even looser translations will do other things. Mother dear, dearest mother, things like that. You'll, you'll find that in some looser translations. But it all misses the fact that this is supposed to be, this is supposed to strike you with how formal it is, how distancing it is. It's not a discourteous address. He's not being rude to his mother, but he is certainly not speaking to his mother the way a Jewish man would normally speak to his mother. He does not address her as mother. He says woman. It's, it's kind of like the way we would use, if we were more formal people, we might use the term madam, you know. I would say we might use the word ma'am, except where I grew up in the South, we actually did call our mothers ma'am. Yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. And so it was actually a, a common thing for children to call their mothers ma'am. But, but maybe, maybe if, we, if we insert the word madam there, we kind of get the sense of the way Jesus is addressing his mother. It's respectful, but it's purposefully distancing. It's overly formal, right? And then he says, what does this have to do with me? Only 
that's not exactly what he says. What he actually says in the Greek is, if you were to translate it literally, is what of you and of me? Which, of course, is bad English. And so whenever that phrase occurs in the New Testament and in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, which it does several times, it is always translated like this. What do we have to do with each other? What common ground do we have? That's what he's saying. What point of commonality do we have with each other right now? In fact, in the New Testament, that phrase is always used by demons speaking to Jesus. <laughs> what common ground do we have? What do we have to do with each other, Jesus? That's what Jesus here is saying to his mother. In essence, what Jesus is saying is we are not on the same page. It's not unlike what he will later say to Peter. You have in your own mind the things of man, not the things of God. We're not thinking along the same lines, Jesus says to his mother. We're we're not in a point of commonality. We're not on the same page. He's distancing himself from her. And in fact, I think we can say he's, he's presenting Mary, in essence, with a couple of options here. On the one hand, he is saying, who do you think I am? If, if I am just a wedding guest like you at this wedding, then what on earth should I do about this? What responsibility do I, do I have at this wedding feast to save this guy's bacon and provide wine for him? It's his fault. It's not my fault. It's not my responsibility. If I'm not just a wedding guest, why are you bringing this to me? On the other hand, he's saying, if I am something else, If, in fact, I am the Messiah, if, in fact, I am the one to whom every bridegroom is a symbol, if my marriage, my ultimate marriage to my people, is the marriage to which every earthly marriage points, then I am intimately involved in this wedding, and I do have a responsibility to make sure everything goes well. So, mother, dearest, which is it? What commonality do we have? Why do you ask me for this? That's what he's saying. And that by itself becomes a point of application for us because that's the same dilemma that we are all given with Jesus. Who do we think that he is? Is he just someone else? Is he just an attendant at the wedding? Is he just somebody who said some nice things a long time ago? Did he just preach good sermons? Maybe is he just somebody who performed some interesting miracles? Or is he something greater, something much more important? Which will he be to us? We have to decide or else we can claim nothing in him. The greatest relationship of all is offered to us by Jesus, but only when we accept that we have nothing to offer but ourselves. So he says, woman, what have we to do with each other? And then he says that other odd statement there at the end of verse 4, my hour has not yet come. My hour has not yet come. Now, if you're like me, you read this, and I remember reading this growing up, and my assumption, the assumption I think of most people as I read this, is that what Jesus means by that is he's saying, my time for performing miracles isn't here yet. You know, clearly, Mary wants him to do something. We know what Jesus is going to do because we've read the story. So it sounds like maybe what Jesus is saying is, if you expect me to perform some kind of miracle in order to save this wedding celebration, I need to tell you the time for me to do miracles hasn't arrived yet. That's kind of how it sounds initially. But that's not at all what Jesus means. That cannot be what Jesus means here. The reason we know that cannot be what Jesus means here is because that phrase, my hour, is used repeatedly in John's gospel, either in the first person or the third person, Jesus speaking about himself, my hour, or somebody else, John, speaking about Jesus, his hour. That phrase is used eight times in John's gospel, and every single time, every single time without exception, It refers to the hour of Jesus' death. Whenever Jesus speaks about his hour, he's speaking about his death, the hour of his death. So then the question becomes, well, why would Jesus bring that up here? Why is Jesus here when his mother asks him to do something about this wedding catastrophe? Does Jesus say, my time for my death has not yet come? It's completely confusing unless we're viewing this through the lens of the ultimate relationship of marriage between God and his people. And then it becomes clear, right? Because then we understand that the ultimate relationship of marriage between God and his people can only be purchased through the death of Jesus, right? And then suddenly it all falls into place. Jesus is the ultimate bridegroom, and he's there at this wedding feast, and he's watching these beautiful things happening, but he's thinking 
of his own ultimate marriage to his bride. And he's thinking of the fact that in order for that relationship to happen, in order for his people to be purchased for him, in order for people from every tribe and tongue and people and nation to be united together into the glorious bride, the church, he himself must die. His blood must be shed. And so it's into this that Jesus says, we are not thinking along the same lines. My hour has not yet come. By the way, we have, uh, we have sanction to understand this in this way because all through John's gospel, Jesus is constantly seeing eternal significance in mundane earthly things. In fact, he does this uh, to the confusion and frustration of his disciples and sometimes us as we read the story. Jesus is constantly looking at earthly things that are happening and seeing eternal symbolisms in the fact, right? When they forget to bring bread on a boat trip, Jesus says, beware the leaven of the Pharisees and they're scratching their heads going, why is he upset? Because we forgot bread. And Jesus says, no, I'm not talking about that, right? A few chapters later, Jesus is going to sit at a well and talk to a Samaritan woman and they're talking about water and Jesus suddenly switches and says, I can give you the water of life, Right? Jesus, a few chapters after that, is going to multiply bread and fish for 5,000 people, and they're all happy about that. They all are following him. They all want bread for the next meal as well. And Jesus says, I can give you bread from heaven. And they're like, yes. And he says, no, we're not talking about the same thing. Over and over again, Jesus does this. Later in this chapter, Jesus is going to go into the temple, and he's going to drive out the money changers and those selling animals, and they're going to say, give us a sign. And Jesus is going to say, what? Destroy this temple. And in three days, I'll raise it up. And they all think he's talking about the building, mundane, earthly things. But Jesus is thinking about something eternal, the temple of his body, over and over again in John's gospel. And the disciples hardly ever get it until much later after the Holy Spirit comes. And sometimes we struggle with it. And so I think it's happening here too. My hour has not yet come. Jesus is looking through the mundane, earthly wedding celebration, and he's seeing what that wedding celebration, what that marriage, and what every marriage points to the relationship between God and his people. And he's recognizing the fact and speaking to his mother and to us of the fact that that will not happen until his hour comes upon him and he dies and purchases people for himself. The marriage. Nevertheless, Jesus performs a miracle. Consider the miracle. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. And Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. And so they took it. Jesus tells the servants to fill these stone purification vats with water and then draw some out. Again, if you read this without understanding some of the background here, your assumption is going to be that what Jesus is telling the servants to do is to fill up these great stone vats and then take some of that water to the steward, the master of the feast. But that's not what's happening in the original language. What's happening, according to the original language, is Jesus is saying, yes, fill up these stone water jars, these great big stone vessels that are used, John tells us, for purification rites, so presumably at this wedding feast, the guests, if they're devout, observant Jewish people, they're washing their hands, they're washing utensils, because that was part of the ceremonial rites of cleaning, right? Jesus says, fill these up to the brim. And then the word that he uses when he says, draw some out, does not mean draw some out of the, of the uh, water vats. It's a Greek word that specifies drawing water out of a well. What he's saying is, now go back to the well and draw some out and take that to the master of the feast. It ha the, the word has to mean that. So you get the picture? He says, fill up the stone vats to the brim, and then go back to the well, draw more water, and take it to the master of the feast. And they do it. The steward, we find out, is delighted with the water that has become wine. Notice, by the way, there's no, uh, th there's no fanfare about this miracle is there? We're, not, we're never told the water uh, miraculously transformed into wine, the molecules shift. You know, we're not told anything about how it happens. All we read is that Jesus says, take the water to the master, and then suddenly it has become wine. It just happened. Jesus changes the water into wine just as easily as he created the water in the first place. Back at the beginning of chapter one, everything was made by him. Yeah. You know? When the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine. There's the miracle right there. That's all, that's all we get for the miracle. 
He tasted the water, now become wine. He did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water from the well, that's, that's the best translation of the verb, the servants who had drawn the water from the well knew. The master of the feast called to the bridegroom and said, everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine, but you have kept the good wine until now. The steward, the master of the feast, the person who has uh, been entrusted by the groom and his family with emceeing this whole event, he's delighted with this wine. Isn't it an interesting picture? It's not that, it's not that the wine, it's, it's not that you have six stone water vats that are now filled to the brim with good wine. That would be a miracle enough. Jesus says, fill those stone water vats with wine because I'm turning the rest of this well into alcohol. The well becomes wine. We're going to talk about that in just a second. The steward commends the groom for his wisdom. And that really is a commendation here. He says everyone serves the good wine first. And, and we understand what he's saying, right? This would, be a, this would be a good way to save some money, right? You buy a certain amount of good quality wine. And everybody, when they still have all their faculties about them, they drink it and they all toast your good taste and the fact that you have, uh, you're such a classy person. And then when they've had enough that their sensibilities are a little bit softened, then you pull out the cheap stuff. Right? That's what the steward is saying, yeah? But he says to the groom, you're better than that, right? You're wiser than that. You're, you're obviously richer and more generous than that. You have saved the good wine until now. You don't care about pulling out cheap wine. You don't have any cheap wine in your larder. You just pull out the good stuff. He's commending him, right? And then it says the groom said, oh, no, that wasn't me. I didn't do that. I think it was that guy over there. Do you read that? Does it say that anywhere? <laughs> By which I take that the groom was a smart guy, right? <laughs> Just a, just a note to husbands, right? If you get commended for doing something that you didn't do, just roll with it. Right? <laughs> That's what this groom does. He rolls with it. He, 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 he's being commended for something he didn't do. He is getting the credit for something that Jesus did. <laughs> Sounds familiar, right? Th this miracle becomes a microcosm of the gospel. It becomes a, a foreshadowing of the entire gospel. That's what the gospel is. Us getting credit for something Jesus did. It's the gospel in a nutshell. Jesus lived a perfect life. Jesus never sinned, but we get the record. We get the record of a perfect life. We get the record of never sinning. Jesus did it, but God says to us, look at you. You're perfect. You're righteous. Christ is not just a miracle worker. He is the Savior of those who believe. And the result is given to us there in verse 11. This is the first of his signs he did it there at Cana in Galilee, and he manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. This is what we were told in John's uh, first chapter was going to happen. If you had time to go back and, and look at chapter 1, you see the calling of the first disciples. And at the end of chapter 1, Jesus, in a conversation with Nathaniel, says to him, Are you surprised at what you've seen so far? You're going to see greater things than these. You will see the heavens opened and angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. You'll see greater things than these. And, and then immediately on the heels of that is this story where it concludes by saying Jesus manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. That's what we need, isn't it? We cannot simply marvel at Christ's miracle. We're not supposed to just read this and go, well, isn't this cool? Jesus turned water into wine. That's not the, the point. We're not just supposed to be uh, uh, amazed at the miraculous nature of it. We're supposed to be able to catch a vision of Jesus' glory here. He manifested his glory. You, as you read Scripture, are supposed to be able to see a glimpse of God's glory. That's part of my job as a preacher. That's what, that's what sermons are supposed to do. They're supposed to help you catch a vision of the glory of God in the pages of Scripture. But I can't do that. You're not capable of receiving that unless the Holy Spirit does it. And so we have to cast ourselves upon the mercy of God and ask Him to give us a vision of His glory because that's what we need. We need to see the glory of God. We need to see the beauty of Jesus. We need to, we need to be amazed by Him, delighted by Him. 
Brothers and sisters, that doesn't happen all the time, right? We're, we don't live in a constant state of being constantly amazed, constantly filled with a knowledge of the glory of God, but it happens sometimes. Have you experienced it sometimes? Sometimes, once in a while, as you're reading the book, or maybe it comes to you when you're listening to, to really powerful worship music or really powerful rock music that shows you something about the nature of God and creation, or something happens and you see a vision of the glory of God. It happens once in a while, right? And the tears come to your eyes just a little bit. We need that. And I want you to have that. You need to have that. Brothers and sisters, if you don't ever experience that, again, you're not supposed to experience it all the time. Someday we will. Right? But right now, we don't get it all the time. But I want to invite you, if you've never had that experience, if you've never caught a vision of the beauty of Jesus, if you don't know what that means, let's talk before you go. It's precious and it's necessary. Yes. You need it. This is the relationship that we were made for. It's the greatest relationship of all. It's offered to us by Jesus Christ, but only once we accept that we have nothing to offer but ourselves. Now, we see the marriage and the miracle itself. Let's spend a few minutes talking about what it all means. What it all means. The miracle is clearly symbolic. This is about more than just Jesus saving a, a first century bridegroom from embarrassment. There's more going on here than that. There's a reason Jesus chose to begin his public ministry in this way. This is a symbolic thing. Jesus' own first response to his mother sets us up to see the miracle symbolically. And in a very real sense, all of the major miracles in John are symbolic. That's why here in verse 11, he calls it a sign. This is the first of his signs and there are more signs throughout John's gospel. In fact, later in July, when Mark addresses us, he's going to spend some time helping us see the signs as they're presented to us throughout John's gospel. So how does the symbolism, the sign nature of this miracle work? Well, consider once more those purification vats that we mentioned. Understand that the, the, the people of Israel used those vats for ceremonial cleansing, and some of that ceremonial cleansing was prescribed in Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers, and we've been reading about some of those things. There were some water cleansing rites that they were supposed to go through. But over the centuries, by the time we get to the first century where we're reading about right now, those practices had, had ballooned into something that they were never intended to be in the first place. So, so by this time, the, the, the Jewish people, if they're observant, are, are washing everything in every way, all the time washing themselves. They're, in some cases, they're getting into vats if they're big enough and dunking themselves, which is the, one of the origins for baptism as it occurs later on. Okay? But here's why that's important. It's because those purification vats, they mean something. They represent something. John tells us that they are used for Jewish ritual purification because he wants us to understand them that way. He wants us to understand that these jars represent the Jewish religion as it was at that point. And the fact that Jesus says, first, fill up those vats to the brim and then draw water from the well and take it to the steward, that tells us something too. I think it's as though Jesus is saying, you have your practices you have your human means of purification. You have your attempts at cleansing. And we're going to give you all of the leeway you need. Fill those vats up to the brim. Let them do everything they possibly can. But the reality is that's all still just going to be water. It can't accomplish anything. It can't meet you where you need. In order to get what you need, you have to go to the source, to the well. The new wine from the well represents Jesus' new brand of God-centered righteousness. It is symbolic of what God can do for his people. By having the servants fill up those vats to the brim first, Jesus is essentially saying, let's max out the capacity for human cleansing. Let's give human means of self-righteousness its greatest possible shot at solving this problem. And then when we realize that it won't ever solve the problem, let's turn away from that and find the only real solution at its source. Draw from the well and take that to the master of the feast. The only true means of righteousness is through Jesus Christ. What do those full to the brim water vats do? What part do they play in solving the problem at hand? Nothing. They do nothing. They are useless. 
You see what John is telling us in this miracle? He's saying our means of human purification, the things that we invent for ourselves to make us right with God, the things that we think we can do to reconcile ourselves to God, it's all useless, worthless. There's nothing we can bring. We only can have this relationship when we realize that we have nothing to offer but ourselves. So much of our labor is nothing more than the filling up of useless purification vats. It's a poignant picture if you let yourself lean into it, isn't it? How much time do we spend scooping water into our human-made purification vats that we invented for ourselves for means of accomplishing cleansing that we think we need? And all the time Jesus is saying, the well is right there. And it's all, it's all choicest possible wine. The greatest relationship of all is offered to us by Jesus, but only when we accept that we have nothing to offer but ourselves. My question to you, brothers and sisters, this morning is, are you enjoying this wine, this new wine? Are you reveling in the relationship with God that only Jesus can provide? Are you ready to accept the reality that the greatest relationship of all is the one offered to you by Jesus? I want to close by reading to you the description of Jesus' own wedding celebration. The wedding that I have no doubt he was thinking of 2,000 years ago as he spoke to his mother here at Cana in Galilee. Listen to these words from Revelation. I'm going to read a long section of Revelation, jumping around the last few chapters of Revelation a little bit. I want you to think about this as the ultimate relationship, the final relationship, the one that you were made for and that you can have freely in Christ. Listen. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder crying out, Hallelujah! For the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exalt and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints." And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. And a little bit later, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. And the first of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues spoke to me saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, its radiance like a most rare jewel. The angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. On either side of the street of the river, the tree of life with its twelve kinds of fruit yielding its fruit each month the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations no longer will there be anything accursed but the throne of God and of the lamb will be in it and his servants will worship him and they will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads friends that's marriage language they will take his name we will have the name of God and the spirit and the bride say come And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty come, the one who desires the water of life without price. Do you desire the water of life? Are you thirsty for it? Are you thirsty for the greatest, the truest relationship? The one relationship to which all earthly relationships point? This is the message of the gospel. Come. Jesus the eternal bridegroom has offered it to you. Take a few moments to come to Jesus again in your hearts, to fall in love with him again, to ask the Spirit to open your eyes to see his beauty for what it is. And then after a few moments of silent reflection and prayer, we're going to sing one final song that reminds us of what we have been given by our bridegroom, 
by Jesus.